and uh, and how many you test hands up? How many of you were here last time when Hazel Hazel did her talk? Oh, we've got we've got <laughs> sort of half and half, Hazel. So so just uh, oh. just treat it treat it as if no one was here. <laughs> no, great, no, no problem at all. Magic. Um, well, thank you very much uh, for my intro. Um, so the first presentation is going to be uh, uploaded soon. So you can, if you haven't seen it, then you can go back and, and see what we covered there. Um, I tried not to make it too dry, but I was also trying to make it um, kind of interesting for anyone that wanted to have a go so that you were actually getting the practical skills that you needed to look at breath. Um, and all those kind of slightly dry things. But the last thing I wanted to do was kind of say like, oh, like off you go and refinish furniture and slap some paint on it because that is not how you do it. And I want to make sure that if you do get a go, then you get the really good results um, that I want you to have. So go back and look at the first one once it's uploaded if you've not seen it. Um, and it's always hopefully going to be there. So if you need to refer back to it, um, then have a look at that. And also um, at the end, you'll get my uh, Facebook and Instagram. So anyone's got any questions, um, there's no silly questions. And I'm always kind of, my DMs are open, as the young people say, but I don't use them anymore. Um, so you can always uh, ping me a question. I'm always happy to answer. Um, so today we're going to get back into the middle um, and just have a wee look at, well, lots of things really, um, but the, the end of the slightly drier stuff, which is kind of tools that you'll need, things that it's really good to have in your arsenal, things that are really handy and things that you don't really need. And then we're going to look at the two different types of designs that I create, which are uh, the one that I'm really known for, uh, which is custom taped designs. Um, so kind of how you might start looking at designing your own uh, ones of those, ones that I've done, uh, the kind of pitfalls, pros and cons of stenciling versus uh, tape designs. I also do stencil designs and obviously you can buy any stencil of anything. Um, but what I'm more known for is creating my own custom stencils that I can make to really fit a piece of furniture and make something completely bespoke and unique. And um, so we'll look at that as well. So lots of more of my designs coming up later. So um, we won't be rushing through them at the end like we were last time, I promise. Um, so we're kicking off with a toolbox. So the first thing that is really handy to have is a range of screwdrivers. So I generally have about four different screwdrivers, but these are the two that I use the most. So if you're looking for a, a good Phillips head that isn't too pointy is the trick, because I've got one that's really pointy at the end um, and you will find that that strips your screw heads faster than anything so have a look at the kind of the depth of your point on your phillips head screwdriver and you're looking for one that's pretty shallow especially if you're working with antique furniture really soft screws you get one try and if you strip it then you'll be swearing a lot um, a good uh, flat head screwdriver is also really handy because most antique furniture has flat head screws and um, those uh, faster than you would like as well but those are the ones that you're working with so the really important thing that you're looking to do when you're using screwdrivers on antique furniture particularly if they're made of soft metal, is get your, get your pressure and your angle right from the jump so don't just kind of look at it that your screwdriver is in and kind of hope for the best a lot of them because they're not put in by machines they're uh, put in by hand so they'll have a slight angle on them a lot of them and if you get the angle exactly right get the pressure right press hard against it and turn it slowly then you'll have a much better chance of getting it out because if you just go in heavy handed not at the right angle you'll strip it and as it as i say you'll be swearing small ones are handy as well these little tiny flathead screwdrivers be very here with because they're super sharp and if you're looking at a small mm. screw and think oh well it's it's maybe a, like a little bit small to use my regular size one or my jumbo flathead screwdriver. Um, don't try it with that first before you use this little one because often it's too small and it's too pointy and again it will go right through your soft metals. Really handy to have is if you have a little glasses screwdriver, small crosshead uh, antique screws, this gets them out every time and we'll save you a lot. So I discovered that way too late after stripping a whole bunch of screws. So this one's a really handy one to have. So that's super, that's super good. Um, a hammer and a mallet, all your usual types of things. Um, so those are often really uh, useful. A nail remover, we've got one of those in your toolkit. It can be quite handy getting those little pins and stuff out. But a, a handy modern thing is uh, no more nails because you'll find a lot of your um, antique furniture might have splits or tears or cracks in it. Um, as long as one, at least one side 
of your um, things that you're trying to repair is a porous uh, surface, like open open wood that's heavy varnish on it or something, um, then you can pop a bit of this on, get a good clamp on it on either side and leave it overnight. And that will usually do the trick without having to go kind of crazy with any big repairs. Um, so that's super handy. So next up we are looking at, uh, so sundries, um, it's not really dry, but lots of little things that you can have uh, in your toolkit really inexpensively that will make your life a huge amount easier. So um, one of those things is plastic party plates and bowls. So you can get those um, on, uh, I usually get them on Amazon. I just got a pack of these the other day for, I think it was like 3 99 for 100. Um, and also thinking eco-friendly wise, I, I reuse each plate about five, six times. Um, so I'm still using the same. Uh, I only just replaced the first pack of 100 I bought uh, a year and a half ago. Um, so you can make it last and then you can recycle them. Um, so those are quite handy. So these you would use instead of using a roller tray um, because you'll just spend your life cleaning and cleaning and cleaning your roller tray and it's just a waste of your time really. So these are really handy if you're using your up here your little mini roller because you're doing furniture you're never going to use like a big wall painting roller you're looking for your little mini ones that I showed you last time so these are 10 centimeters on there and it's exactly the right size for your tray so you pop, pop your paint on there and what you're always going to do when you're painting is roll a little bit on and then take a, a different plate you're always going to have two on the go and then roll most of it off so you've got an even coating because the last thing you want to do especially when you're painting furniture but also painting walls and anything else you know when you get that kind of stippling effect or you get that little crackling noise that you can hear that always means you've got too much paint on your roller so um you want to have as little paint as you possibly can on on your roller when you're painting and you will always get a much better finish and um, a lot of the paints these days um fusion or any of the other ones that you'll use a lot of them um are they have a they claim to be self-leveling and they are um so it means that if you put a nice coat on and you've got kind of maybe a little bit of a ruffle on the top leave it and it will smooth out um so that's a really kind of handy property of the paint but it only works if you don't put way too much on to start with so it's always better to do two or three thin coats and try and get it in one or two thick coats because you'll never get as good a finish um, something I use all the time is uh, plastic pipettes. So again, off Amazon, a few quid, plastic pipettes. So if you want to have a play about, um, another thing I'm known for is making custom colours. So um, I've just mixed up one for a client the other day. So spare jam jars. This is not Jarwood's mango chutney um, that my husband seems to go, go through an alarming rate <laughs> of about one, one a week. Um, but I just keep these and I was mixing this yesterday. So I've got my coal black paint and my Liberty Blue paint, which is like a really bright cobalt blue and I've mixed it um, in a two to one ratio to create a really gorgeous inky blue color. So it's, it's almost black, but when you look at it in the light, it's a beautiful blue. But the way that you save yourself wasting a whole bunch of paint is to measure it out in drops on one of your plastic plates. So I was measuring out say 10, 10 drops of uh, coal black, five drops of Liberty Blue ended up being the right one. I went through several different iterations and then I figured out, right, it's a, it's a two to one ratio and that's what I need. And I've done it using less than a teaspoon of paint rather than kind of farting about and trying to get it right and you've wasted half a tub because it's not cheap. So plastic pipettes are your friend. Um, I use uh, pencils, <laughs> really dry thing to talk about. But having really good pencils or just really crap pencils pencil and a soft leaded pencil will be your friend and um, I'll show you why later so a soft leaded pencil just fish one out from your old tool kit um, and that's really handy and a propelling pencil also super handy. Um, a putty rubber don't go on Amazon and get the cheapest one and um, because it's only fractionally cheaper than a Windsor and Newton always buy a Windsor and Newton putty rubber I discovered this because I bought a cheap one when I'd lost my Rusty Windsor and Newton, but I found this when I was cleaning my studio again. This cheap one is rubbish. I don't know if you can see that. It's just covered in lead and it just moves it around and it also is like crumbly and rubbish. So that is rubbish. This is lovely and soft and pliant and you move it around and it is super, super handy. Getting pencil marks off of furniture is 
sanded back as soon as you're looking to apply a design to it and you're marking it out in pencil, putty rubber will get it straight off so that when you leave your exposed parts, it's like, oh God, it's not pencil. So that's a super handy tool. Mm -hmm. um, tape is something I get asked about all the time because I create these tape designs. People are like, but what tape do you use? Um, and you'll see a lot of uh, on uh, Instagram or Pinterest, if you're looking at tape designs, you'll maybe notice that a lot of them kind of look a bit similar. And the reason for that is because the widths in between the painted areas, taped areas are often the same. And that's because most people are using delicate frog tape. And this only comes in two widths. So this is 24 and 36 mil that it comes in. Um, so this is a 24 and that's as, as thick as you'll ever need of that really. Um, and it is super handy. It absolutely does the job. So what you want from uh, the reason you use the yellow one it's got a, a low tack and um, so if you're putting it on top of paint to then do a design on top of that then it's not going to take the paint off underneath it um, and it gives you really good adhesion at your edges what you don't want to do when you're taping is press your edges down really hard to make sure that you get a good adhesion all that's going to do is riffle the edge of your tape so it's going to leave a little a little wave and that's how paint gets underneath so put it on press it down and you'll be grand with that but delicate frog tape is the way to go. And definitely if you're starting out, this is all you'll need, um, I would say. I use this in combination with, um, and a lot of people kind of can't, can't get, get their heads around this. Um, so these are matte cutter blades. So they're, you can just buy regular razor blades, but these are the ones I use because I started off um, doing picture framing. And these are what you use in your mount cutter. And I just discovered that using these by hand is super easy. They are called matte cutter blades, uh, they're Fletcher Terry ones, but they are uh, called super keen for a reason. And that is because you could slice the top of your head off and not notice if you're, if you're not really, really careful. So they are incredibly sharp. Um, and I'll usually get an entire project's worth of cutting out of one blade and there's a hundred in a box and they're say 27 pounds for a box, but then that's a hundred projects worth. So it's, it's definitely worth it. What I do with these is when I've uh, laid out my design and I've taped it out, because you're going to have intersecting lines of tape, if you want to get it really crisp, you're using one of these to cut it where it intersects. And I'll show you on later on on projects, but these are super handy to have. You can use a regular razor blade, but what you're looking out for is your pressure, because obviously you're using it on top of a wood surface. So you want to make sure that you are cutting the tape just, but not gouging the wood. Because um, again, that's going to leave a space for, for paint to get in underneath. Mm -hmm. They're two handy things. If you're wanting to elevate your taping game down the line, then this is a super top secret tip that I have not revealed to anyone. So only the ladies of oh, the SWI. SWI exclusive. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if I want to tell you, really. <laughs> oh, God, God. <laughs> I won't claim this as, as my own uh, because uh, it was actually Alistair, my husband, that um, was like, oh, you might, you might try that. It's uh, kabuki tape. Oh, so yeah. this is used in car detailing. Um, so you may you may well have seen it, but it's so handy because it comes in lots of different widths. So this is what's really elevated my game and set me aside from other people is all those other people have 24 mil between all of their tape designs. Whereas I've got between six mil and 35 mil in between mine. Um, and it comes in, in lots of different ones. It's fractionally less good would be the way to phrase it um sometimes it does let little bits of, of paint underneath um so you've, you've got to kind of be quite careful while you're using it but something that you can use to clean up both in stenciling which i'll talk about later but also in taking if you get those little like little dots outside your sharp lines and you're just like looking and going oh it's so annoying because otherwise it looks perfect take your razor blade or your mat cutter blade and just very gently tease it off and it'll come it'll come right off Alternatively, um, we talked about last time having your uh, cheapo kit of um, really inexpensive makeup brushes. Take one of your little brushes, teeny, teeny tiny bit of paint boop, on the edge, you're good to go. So um, a lot of people, I was uh, actually on a, um, a Facebook call to a, well, I want to call her a super fan, but she is, um, in, in, in uh, Arizona. Um, so she, she wanted to have a call with me to discuss uh, kind of a project that she had on the go. She's like, but all of your projects just look perfect. And it's like, they weren't perfect before I photographed them. They weren't perfect when I first 
kind of like did all the paint and took all the tape off, they weren't perfect. I'd probably spend about anywhere between one and three hours remediating a piece before it's finished. So don't get disheartened if you take your tape off or you um, kind of peel back your layers or you finish your last coat and you're looking at it like, oh, it's not how I imagined it mm-hmm. because it never is. So just stick with it and look at it. And sometimes I just step away from it for an evening and I'll go in and I'll rant and moan. And I'm like, oh God, this has already taken me like five, six, seven days. And then I'll come back in the morning with a game plan. Be like, right, okay, to fix that, I need to do this. To fix that, I need to do this. And once I put this on and do that, then it'll I want it. So stick with it. You'll be absolutely fine. Um, so next up we are, uh, oh yes, we've got a slide. Woo-hoo. I'm gonna go to slides, yeah? Yes, so slide number 28. Okay. Can you all see that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, perfect. Um, um, right, so I'm just going to extend my slide screen a bit. Um, right, so, um, so we're gonna look at the difference between um, stenciling and taping. So um, kind of what are the pros and cons? So um, I'm just trying to, <laughs> see what I've actually written there. Um, so a great thing for sparking creativity, if you're not quite sure where to start, is start off stenciling because it will give you an idea of the type of aesthetic that you like and that will dictate what methods you use. Um, so I've ended up kind of going in, in both directions, obviously, but this was one of the, the first pieces that I did. So um, the piece that I showed last time, the big long sideboards, that was the, the first piece that I did in collaboration with someone else. This is the first piece that I did by myself. Um, so I got a little um, antique vendor. They used to do oh, back before COVID. Um, Ramsey Cornish Auction House in Edinburgh, they did uh, lane sales. Um, and it was all the stuff that didn't sell in the auctions and they, they literally just like one pound, two pound, three pound cash, poof, um, no commission, it's awesome, it's a great place for picking up finds, but obviously we've not been doing it since COVID, so I was really lucky to get this beautiful um, walnut rotating card table and it's just gorgeous. Um, so this is where I started out and sometimes if you're looking at a piece, get your range of stencils and sometimes they just fit perfectly which is what this one did so as you'll see it fits perfectly in the corner to corner and it leaves a space in the middle and that was just how it worked out obviously I, I finagled the border to make it fit like that um but that's a really good place to start out is is um stenciling so the one of the other benefits of stenciling over taping is obviously you can create a lot more organic shapes so if we go to the next slide um because with with tape there's only so many curves that you can create this is um one of my newest pieces um which was a tall boy that I decided to for a client who'd pretty much given me free reign we decided on a pair of bedsides that were going to be leopard print and then she said do what you want on the tall boy so she was having a really bum time and I thought I know what I'll cheer her up a snake print Mm -hmm. um so I created this stencil from scratch for her um and it lets you as you can see it lets you create lots of different layers of color Um, So I actually ended up creating this using two different stencils that I overlaid. So all the grey parts is one stencil and then the blue and copper parts um, is a different stencil. Um, And as you can see on this piece, there was a lot of stenciling. So this is probably about 12 hours worth of stenciling because I've also done the whole top surface. And there's a a band around the top and it's got an an inset on top that's also Um, But it's super effective and it's really organic, but you could never create that using tape. So it, it does allow you to do completely different things. If we go on to the next slide, um, and you'll see uh, even more organic shapes of being a leopard print. So again, that's a, a two-part stencil. So the, the spots in the middle and then the, the bits on each side, that's a, a double-layered stencil again, but you could never create that using tape. And it just, uh, again, creating your own stencils lets you do things that are, you know, completely fitted um to the piece so um yeah so those turned out those turned out really great and my um it definitely gave my uh my client a, a big smile on her face when she went and, and delivered those because she was she was not expecting it so it was nice i don't think i've ever made anyone completely speechless but she was so 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 hazel do, you, do those stencils then are they um i take it what one is what obviously one is the black or the darker color one is mm-hmm. one is the, the the yellow or the lighter color, and um, um, yeah. So the background is painted one color, and then there's two stencils on top of it. Is that how it works? 
Yes, so, so on the drawers, because of the, um, the see the, the circular part where the handle is in the middle, um, that couldn't be removed. So you couldn't get in and um, and sand the full surface of the front of that drawer. It also has the band around the outside is also a raised ridge. So that's when you've got to be kind of a bit strategic when you're looking at a piece and you're like, right, what can, from the beginning, what can I sand? What can I sand? And then you're looking at, do I want to sand? Is it worth it? Is the wood nice? Is it lovely to look at? Or actually, is it a bit crappy? And, and do I not want to do that? So these pieces actually were a good example. They were sold to my client as um, as cherry, but they ended up being pine. So that's why I've only left really a very fine border around the edges, which looks nice and it gives it a lift and dimension. Oh. But it's um, it's not like anything particularly worth writing home about. So what I did was um, to create the kind of contrast within the piece using exactly the same stencil is painted the behind the, the drawer fronts, the dark gray, and then stenciled on top using one stencil with yellow dots and then copper for the bits around the edges. And then on top, I've used exactly the same two stencils, but I've sanded the whole top back and done the yellow spots with the, the around the edges um, to create kind of a, a different look with exactly the same stencil just on a on a different type of surface so that's that's onto the bare wood all right i see so that's the grain of the wood with below it yeah it is great yeah great. yeah nice so that's quite cool yeah. um so let's see what's the next one um so then if you go into the next slide so you can often use the same stencil um in a variety of different ways um so this one was the back of a victorian wash stand that i did and when i got it it had really dark, old, very, very dirty tiles inset into the back of that. So I took the whole back panel of it off, um, took the tiles out, sanded the surface. So the bit that you see as, co as copper, um, as, as grey, sorry, um, that's just painted on top of the wood. But if you see, obviously the design is quite swirly itself, but behind that in the copper lines, you'll see those kind of lovely shapes. That's actually just the grain of a really rough piece of old crappy wood. That stenciled on it with a beautiful design, all of a sudden it, it comes alive. Um, and then if you go into the next slide, so I've used the same stencil but the other way round on top of a, a, a console table that I did in a really dark navy and I did the stencil in the copper. Um, well, and it takes on a, a completely different stencils, Hazel, or was that was that a purchase stencil? Uh, that was one that I, I made um on my cricket. Wow. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of these ones um, you can buy, but they're like 30, 40, 50 pounds, depending on what size and where you buy them from. And um, yeah, Scottish girl through and through, I'm too tight and I've got a cricket. So if it takes me two hours to make it on my cricket, then it's worth it because I've used the stencil about five different times and it gives clients something that most other people don't have. Um, and also, again, it allows me to create things that I can make exactly the right size to, to fit a particular piece. So um, that's great. What, what the cricket is? Oh yeah, so a cricket is, um, it's like a very modern version of a die cutting machine. Um, so you would, um, I've got, it's actually underneath my laptop just now, so I can't quite show you. So it's about, about this big. Um, and uh, you attach your laptop to it um, and it's got a function of either uh, drawing and cutting or uh, drawing and scoring. Um, so it's like a little attachment where you put in tiny, tiny blade, you attach it to your computer, it's got uh, affiliated software and you just go in that software, upload an image into it, you can play about with the image, cut bits out of it, maximise, minimise, put it with other stuff, create exactly what you want, import it into the programme and then um, attach it to your machine and then just hit go. Mm -hmm. And it cuts exactly what you want, exactly where you want it. Um, it takes a good amount of finagling to figure out how to use it but once you do it is super handy um, and I actually I bought it to make our own wedding invitations oh so that's why I have it um because I was looking at kind of the type of invitations that I wanted and it was like oh <laughs> I can't afford that but what I do have is time so um because we, we were getting married in November and we closed our B&B &B in, in October so I thought I've got a month to spend making the most fab, hopefully, as my mother-in-law might concur, beautiful wedding invitations um, that were totally different. What anyone else had, they had a, a bronze like lace effect, effect on the front that was all kind of cut and layered um, and really beautiful, but it's turned out to be a super handy tool for this and it's given me an edge. 
That's great. Now, how much swearing do you think you need to do to learn how to use it? Oh, oh, a lot, a lot. I've nearly thrown it across the room several times. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I'm sure um, because it depends how you learn as well, because I don't learn uh, watching YouTube videos. And there are like Cricket have a huge online presence and they've got their all their own videos, learn how to's. But that's just how I learn. Whereas my husband's like on it all the time. If I say, could you make me an X, Y, or Z? He's like, all oh, right. And goes off and watches five YouTube videos and then does it. Mm-hmm. Um, so if that's if that's an easy way to learn for you, then absolutely. I just get frustrated, try it 50 different ways, scream through it across the room, and then I'll figure it out by myself. Yeah, that's <laughs> that sounds about right. <laughs> different structure, different books. <laughs> yes. So this is um, a good example of... Um, when you can kind of make different stencils fit different things. So this client wanted a set of G plan tables done with a kind of almost like a themed effect, like these creatures that just landed on her tables. So I was able to create three bespoke stencils um, of a dragonfly, a pair of moths, and a set of bees um, that just fit each different size of table. Um, so those have worked out. Um, well and then I've used the kind of the the bees on other things um bits of the moths on other things so they're they're really handy to have once you've got a stencil in your arsenal it's never like oh well I've wasted two hours doing that because you'll always use it again um, and you never quite know how or when so um so if we uh, if we're thinking about kind of the so those are some of the pro the, the pros of stenciling um what I would say is it is it is time if you're looking for something quick to do, um, if you want a really good result, it's stenciling is, is not the way to go. Um, because if you try and rush it, it won't look the way that you want it to. And you'll be looking at other people's, well, actually, a lot of people's stencils. If you look at them closely on Pinterest or, or Instagram, if you zoom into them, you can tell when they're brushed. Because anything that is outside of the line of those little bubbly dots, um, that's what happens either when you rush or you've got too much paint on your brush or or both. Um, so I'll, I'll do a wee demo um, in a little bit of, of exactly, actually I might as well do it now. So the, the main thing that you're doing with stenciling is, or the, the top tip I can give you for stenciling is use decent size brush because I have wasted so much time. Um, when I was doing the leopard print ones, as a good example, I started off using this brush and like an hour in, I'd done about 10 inches um, and I was just about in tears thinking, okay, I've got two full top and six drawer front to do and I don't know what to do. So sometimes it's good to just pivot. So, but thankfully I had this, which I bought, which is actually a, um, it was sold as a wax brush but it has all the properties that you want of a good stencil, which is completely flat across the top and a wide area. Um, so the, the main thing that you're you're looking for to do with your brush, make sure it's all nice and nice and flexible. It's not any loose hairs, because this one has come with a lot of really loose hair. So even though I've used it four or five times, it's still shedding, which can be a bit annoying. Mm-hmm. Another handy thing to use your razor blade for though because if you're stenciling and you lift off your stencil and you find that you've got a hair laid right across don't try and pick it out with your finger get your tiny little razor blade slip it underneath and pick it off really easy i literally use this for everything alistair jokes that it's like my second husband i love these razor blades (laughs) (laughs) so to show you kind of the difference um so i'll just use the the lid of this this pot of, of fusion here um because it's a really good size for this if you're Starting off stenciling, I'll get my two plastic plates because that's another thing that you need two plastic plates for rather than one. So you get your little boop, just dabbing it on there. So I'll hold that up so you can see that. Yeah, so that's your mm-hmm. kind of paint on the end of your brush. So you're just kind of using just a tiny, tiny dab of paint. And then you're popping it on your plate and you'll see like, oh God, that's quite a lot of plate. And then you're swirling it and swirling it and swirling it and swirling it so there's really just the very mm. finest coating you can't see any little blobs of paint you can't see anything hanging off the end of your brush swirl it again and then i'll show you my, my little bee, bee stencil so the main thing you're doing with stenciling is just a straight up and down motion don't swirl it don't try and poke it into an edge just straight up and down with quite firm pressure. So let's see if I can do this in any way that is 
Um, I'll try and move my camera down so you can see my desk. You see my desk. So just straight up and down. And if you're looking at it thinking, not really enough paint, and that's fine because you can always add more paint, but once you've stenciled and you've buggered it up, you can't get away. So it so we can always add a little bit more and early here no it's not been a very good one to use because it's moved oh, i'll give you the gist of it you can see a halo of it because i've got, managed to get a little bit underneath but see how crisp these edges are around the wing. Just ignore the bit, the halo that's underneath because it's managed to do something quite strange. I'll show you what it looks like when you've got far too much paint. Um, so get my paint on my brush, add it. See that? You see paint all over it. It's all, it looks a bit rough. 